So, good afternoon and very welcome to SNS and this seminar where Professor John van Rienen will present his research and discuss policy frameworks for growth together with Sven Olof Daun Daunfeldt from uh, the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise, Svensk Nærensliv, and Laura Hartmann, Chief Economist at the Swedish Trade Union Confederation, ELO, and you're also the Chief Economist at Svensk Nærensliv. Uh, and hopefully also, of course, with you in the audience. I really encourage you to contribute with your questions and reflection during the panel discussion towards the end of this hour that we have together. This seminar is part of... Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Uh, of the IIS SNS International Policy Talks, uh, which is a collaboration between the Institute for International Economic Studies, that is IIS, at Stockholm University and SNS, with the mission to bring insights from leading international economists to the Swedish policy debate, which is what we're doing here today, hopefully. My name is Ilinka Benson, I am CEO here at SNS since about two weeks, and I have the pleasure of chairing this seminar. So, I would like to welcome John van Rienen on stage. He is the Ronald Coase Chair in Economics and School Professor at the London School of Economics, as well as Director of the Programme of Innovation and Diffusion at LSE, and a Digital Fellow at MIT's Initiative for um, the Digital Economy. And you have published over 100 papers within uh, economics in uh, many different areas, with a particular focus on firm performance and causes and consequences of innovation. And you're also one of the founders and core team members of the World Management Survey, which we might hear a bit more about soon. And you have won uh, numerous awards. I won't list them all, but I would like to mention that some years ago you were appointed officer of the Order of the British Empire by Elizabeth, uh, Queen Elizabeth II. And I would especially like to mention the motivation, services to public policy and economics, which I think is a uh, very sort of rewarding uh, order. And now I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much to SNS and IIES for the invitation, and thank you for all of you for coming uh, to the talk. Um, let, uh, I'm going to talk about growth, threats, opportunities, and also particularly around uh, some issues around climate change. Um, so, you, you know, we, we all know at the moment we live uh, in, in very um, kind of uh, fearful times in, in, in many ways. There are a lot of threats to um, our societies, our economies, and to our growth out there. So, you know, I know this is a particularly uh, uh, uncertain time in Sweden with the elections, but more generally across Europe and around the world, we've had the pandemic from COVID. More recently, we've had the Ukraine crisis, ongoing crisis because of uh, Putin's invasion of Russia. But even before, and this is going to be the, some focus of my, some of my remarks, that these most recent crises occurred, we already had a low productivity growth crisis. So when I talk about growth, I'm going to focus on productivity growth. So that's not just growth as a whole, we often think about is how big the economy is. But what matters to me is not how big the economy is, but how we can produce and consume what we have with less. That's productivity growth. So, you know, if you can improve the way that you produce things, you can actually have more options for what you do. You can actually um, even work less and still, you know, enjoy the same standard of living as, as you currently do. So that's really what I think about productivity growth. And, you know, the fact is, at least since the global financial crisis, productivity growth has been very poor across the world. So here's, uh, sorry, Sweden is not on here, but we have, you know, uh, United States, Euro, uh, Europe, Euro, Euro area, and the United Kingdom since the Second World War. And these are the average productivity growth rates in different time periods since the Second World War. And you know, this last period here is the period since the mid-2000s. And you can see no matter where you look, there's been a, a collapse of the productivity growth rate. This is, this is what comes to call total factor productivity, kind of being, you know, how much more can you get with all the things you're using, your labor, your capital, in terms of output. So it's still growing, but it's growing very, very slowly. And you know, that's a serious worry, because 
um, wage growth, for example, is closely tied to productivity growth. So the slow wage growth that we've had in many parts of the world is very linked to the slow productivity growth. So, um, you know, these are big threats, but I think it's important to think these threats also have some opportunities as well. I'm going to argue that when we think about the threats, we should also think about framing new policies, crafting new policies towards getting sustainable growth, a type of growth which both is sus uh, sustainable environmentally and also uh, as equitable, so it's not just a small a number of people are benefiting from them. So if you think about the challenge, there's a challenge of climate change. To deal with climate change, you need to have green technology and green innovation. Um, we're increasing our defence spending. You know, I know that Sweden is, is, is joining NATO, for example. Um, defence spending is likely to rise, but there's lots of possibilities of civilian spin-offs from those military innovations, which, which is an opportunity. I think the COVID crisis showed how quickly our societies can move. If there's a will between the public sector and the private sector, we generated these, a number of vaccines, not one, but many, very quickly. So it shows you what can happen when research and development and, uh, and effort is put into creating new innovations. So critical to this is innovation and diffusion of new technologies and management practices. And I can argue we know a, lo a lot about what, we, what, what works and what doesn't work. What we need is the political will to join up these policies. And I, I sometimes frame this as a kind of a new Marshall Plan, uh, as, as happened after the Second World War, to create a new kind of growth momentum to deal with some of these, these, these problems and framing this around the crisis we face over the climate, defense, and health. OK, so very quickly, I'll talk about some innovation and diffusion policies. You, know, you might say, you know, many people are say, why should the government get involved with you know, interfering with the market of R&D innovation? There's very good economic arguments why governments have to do this. Um, the most, the, the, what the most the, there's, there's kind of failures of financial markets, but the most important one is that the firms uh, who do research and developments only capture a small part of the benefits. Most of the benefits go to other firms and other people. So therefore, the, the companies themselves don't have enough incentive if you just leave it to the market to do the amount of R&D the society wants. So I think that this was best expressed by uh, Gustave Flaubert, you may know from Madame Bovary, who also wrote uh, the uh, Dictionary of Received Ideas, Le Dictionnaire de, de Reçu. Um, he defined inventors. He said, all die in the poorhouse. Someone else profits from their discoveries. It's not fair. And I think that, that, that summarizes it very well. That in, in economic terms, there's these spillover effects which create market failure. So that actually means why you know, governments have to play an important role in stimulating uh, and supporting innovation. And the empirical evidence here is very clear. So you, know, you can try and measure the social benefits of innovation compared to the private benefits. The social benefits are way larger, three, four, five times as large. And you see that in a number of different ways of measuring that. So what can we do? It's all very well to say there's a problem. What are the policies that we can do around innovation? So you know, the way I think about innovation here is like shifting the world technology frontier, ideas which are new to the world. There's also diffusing those ideas adoption of technology. But in terms of shifting, getting new, new ideas, which is important, you know, if we were in, in, a, in a less developed country like Uganda, we wouldn't worry so much about shifting the knowledge frontier. But in a country like Sweden, which is already very advanced, we can't just rely on adopting other people's ideas. We also have to think about pushing forward the frontier of ideas. So there's lots of policies um, that around innovation. Um, th th this, there's a, a table I call the light bulb table which we've, we try to summarize a lot of the different policies using the kind of evidence uh, on what it, what's effective and what's not. And I don't expect to go through the whole table. I just want to give you a flavor of what we try to do. It's very useful to communicate to policymakers. So what we did is we looked at a whole load of policies from tax to university reform to um, improving, improving people's skills. We looked at the evidence. Uh, we tried to do a kind of cost-benefit analysis which we measured by light bulbs. So three light bulbs is very good, and no light bulbs is very bad. And then we also try to think about the time frame of different policies and the effect of inequality. So you know, the kind of policies, roughly, that we looked at, uh, you could call them demand side policies, so direct giving grants to firms, uh, tax reforms, such as research development tax credits, um, supply side policies, such as uh, universities or um, trying to deal with what we call the Los Einsteins exposure policies in a minute. But broadly, you know, we try to look at all of these and boil the ocean. Many of, some of these policies are not effective, but many of them are very effective in terms, of, uh, in terms of trying to stimulate more innovation. So tax policy, for example, one of the things that many governments have, including Sweden, is to give um, 
tax breaks to firms who do more research and development. This was introduced, for example, in the UK in 2000, and some of our calculations suggest that um, you know, UK R&D would be about 13% lower were it not for the supportive tax system. So it's been effective in raising R&D. Um, you know, it's only a small part of the, the British productivity problem, but it's been, it would be even worse were it not for the uh, more generous research and development tax credits which were introduced. Okay, so one set of policies is around these demand side policies, stimulating the demand for R&D. The problem with those policies, or one of the problems, is that if you just stimulate the demand, you try and get more firms doing research and you know, uh, more, more, more grants, is if you haven't got a good supply of inventors, if you haven't got the kind of engineers and technicians and people who can invent, all you're going to do is uh, increase the demand and therefore increase the wages of scientists, good for people like me, but not good for the taxpayer. So you want to, in order to really get long-run growth innovation, you want to increase the supply of potential and actual inventors and uh, R&D scientists. So how do you how do you do that? Um, many ways. You could think about expanding the scientific and engineering workforce, skilled immigration, although controversial and important and effective role. I only mention one policy which is not often thought of as innovation policy. I call this the lost Einstein and lost Marie Curie type of policies. And this is based on the fact that if, if you look at the people who are inventors, whether you look at people who are on patents or in science, it's very clear that there's relatively few women compared to men, fewer minorities compared to majorities, and much fewer kids who are born into low-income backgrounds than kids who are born into high-income backgrounds. So some work that I've done with Raz Chetty and co-authors in the United States shows this very clearly. If you're born in the top 1%, so your parents in the top 1% of the income distribution, you're 10 times more likely to grow up to be an inventor than if you were born in the bottom 50%. And we calculate you could maybe quadruple the innovation rates in the US if you could remove some of those barriers to the potential inventors, the inventors we never see, the lost Einsteins, the lost Marie Curies, through um, removing those barriers. And those barriers may be to do with education, they may be to do with you know, mentoring programs, they may be to do the neighborhoods kids grow up in, there may be discriminatory barriers, and all, all number of things. But those types of policies, I think, could in the long run be very important part of improving the overall innovation performance. So innovation is one part. What about diffusion of, uh, of those innovations? Um, two types of diffusion, te technological diffusion, computers, ICT, and so on. I, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to focus on management practices. This is much less realized, but I think this is also in a really important way of raising productivity, as many of you in the private sector, I'm sure, are aware of. So, you know, as, 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 as was mentioned, uh, I've been involved the last uh, 15 years or so with trying to uh, get better measures of management. So uh, we have this thing called the World Management Survey. We try to measure manager quality based on very basic things, you know, how good a management, like collecting data, setting targets, dealing with human resources. Um, we can get into the details in, in, in the question and answer, but broadly, this is a measure of management quality. Um, and if you look at the kind of scores on across different countries, they kind of look what you might expect. So these are co highly correlated with the productivity scores across country. Sweden does very well. So Sweden is you know, near, near the top of uh, the, rank, the ranking. You can see that you know, other, other wealthy countries are up there in Western Europe. You go down, you get to Southern European countries, emerging economies, and poorer countries at the bottom. It's kind of not so dissimilar to what you might expect. What's really fascinating to me, though, is that there's a huge variation within countries. So it's not as if, um, for example, you know, if you compare the United States and India, every American firm is awesome and every Indian firm is terrible, there's a huge variation within every country. Um, what's almost you know, important about the United States, and even in Sweden, here's massive variation that you see. Um, what's important is that you know, um, the, the, the really badly performing firms, this kind of lower, lower tail of firms, there's far fewer of them in the more successful countries like the United States and Sweden than there would be in India or some of the developing countries. So that, that suggests the process of competition or creative destruction is good at selecting out those very poorly managed firms in some countries compared to others. Um, the, the management scores are important, so they maybe explain about a third of all the productivity differences you see across the world, you know, a fair chunk of some of the differences of gaps between Sweden and the United States, for example. So these things matter not just at the company level, but also at a macroeconomic level. And again, we go through a number of different policies to how you could think about raising manager quality, for example, through strengthening competition and being open to trade, 
or through more direct interventions like training or consultancy. There's much less is known about these ones actually than the more structural ones. So you know, competition clearly or education are strong ways of improving managerial practices. Okay, so the last, uh, last kind of eight or nine minutes of my talk, I want to shift onto climate change as the kind of major long run threat that we, uh, we face as a, as a, as a species. And, um, you know, I, I think one of the problems, as we know, with climate change policies is that, you know, we, we want to reduce global emissions. But the problem is that, you know, every country would like another country to do it. We like to free ride off the efforts that other, other countries do. And, of course, if every country takes that attitude, then, you know, as my colleague Nick Stern would say, we should just start buying shares and suntan lotion companies because nothing is going to change. So we have to... Um, Think about how we deal with that. That's why we have international agreements. Again, those are, those are, hard, those are hard to do. Um, the kind of policies that are often put forward by myself, like economists, we think about carbon taxes. Those are important. Regulation, that's important. But those are never, I think, going to be sufficient to get to the green transition to net zero that we need. In order to do that, we also need to think about technology, how to improve the spread of green technologies and also innovate clean technologies at the frontier. So the question is, you know, can policy do this? What kinds of policies can we do to direct climate, climate uh, innovation towards climate change? And there's a, there's a whole um, growth of new a wave of studies in, in, in economics suggesting there are ways to do this. There are ways to kind of steer technological change across a range of electric, whether it's electric vehicles or, or, or energy and so on. So I'm going to mention one study, which is an ongoing piece of research I'm working on with a team of people at LSE including Robin Burgess, around solar power. And the reason we look at solar power is that, you know, there's lots that can make you depressed <laughs> if you think about um, climate change. But solar is a, is, a, is, a, is a positive story. So this is the price of solar power since the mid-1970s. In, in about 1976, it cost something like $100 to get a watt of energy from solar power. By uh, 2020, it cost about 25 cents. So that's an extraordinary fall of the price of, of solar power over this time period. Of course, this is a key part of the movement to kind of renewables. So, you know, what, you know, what caused this? I mean, technological change helped cause this. Um, who's providing the, the, the solar panels, the, the, the products that go into, into solar? Well, it's been different countries over time. Um, the leading country, you know, used to be the United States, then it became Japan, for a while it was Germany, but certainly for since about 2007 it's been China. So there's been this enormous growth of the production of solar panels in China, which has helped to kind of reduce the price. But China is not just producing more, it's also innovating more. So if you look at patents uh, that Chinese solar firms take out, that has had this enormous growth. Uh, since the mid-1990s. Now, you know, you might think, well, these, this is exaggerated because some of this, the patents taken out in China are of low value. But if you look at um, the patents taken out by Chinese firms in the US Patent Office or the European Patent Office, although it's not as dramatic as this, you still see exactly the same trend. And if you went to the other end of the spectrum and said, okay, in, you know, in, in solar, they have these competitions over who can produce the a solar, a solar panel from a cell which has the greatest efficiency, produces the greatest amount of energy. So these are competitions which universities and companies take part in all over the world. So you can really see how the frontier of solar power is advancing. And if you look at those competitions, it's quite striking. So in, you know, in, the, in 1975, all of them were won by America. <laughs> you know, that's, the, that's, the, that's the line here. Like basically, the Americans won everything. And then over time, the Europeans, the Germans, the, you know, the Japanese, we started to win a few more. Um, but by the end of the period, by 2020, China was, wi was winning almost 20% of these competitions. So this is, you know, this is innovation right at the frontier. So what's happened, you see, in China is they moved from you know, just producing the kind of low-value solar panels to the high-value solar panels to innovating to really starting to push to the frontier. So w why did this happen? What was, you know, what, what, you know, how, how, did, how did this industrial policy in China uh, change things. So, you know, China has put a lot of policy efforts into this. What we do in the paper, and I won't go through the details, we put a lot of data together, uh, firm level data in China on uh, production, capacity, the inputs in the solar panel energy, exports, patent data from the, so from the um, different patent offices, and policies. So there's, uh, there's this amazing data set called the PKU Law data set, which um, describes all the policies in China across a range of areas, and we took all the solar power policies out, 
at the national level, the province level, and the city level. So what we, what we did was we did you know, a kind of, um, you could call it a quasi-experiment or natural experiment in economics. So we looked at those cities which started to introduce different policies towards solar. Um, the, the main policy we actually, which, we, which were effective were policies around the production of solar panels and the innovation R&D subsidies. So we, we took those policies and we said, well, let's look at the cities which introduced them compared to the cities which look similar in all other respects in terms of the riches and size but didn't introduce the policies. What happened to production? What happened to innovation as measured by patenting activity? And it was very clear. It seems to be very clear in the data. So this is production of solar panels. Um, this... Uh, this is, this is, these are the cities which introduced the policies. These are the cities which didn't introduce the policies. I'm giving you an example of 2007, but we do it for all years. And you can see that after the policies were introduced, there was a really dramatic increase of output. And you might say that's not surprising. You're paying, you know, you're paying firms to produce solar panels. You see more of them produced. So that's, you know, that's unsurprising. You know, that, that, that's not a, not a big deal. What's more kind of interesting is if you look at patenting. So if you look at the patenting, the innovation activity, um, you also see, with a longer lag, an increase of patenting of innovation after the introduction of these policies. And one story over why this is happening is a kind of learning by doing story. So what happens is that firms start producing more and more solar panels, and they start learning. Well, you know, this, it gives the engineers new ideas of how they can produce things more efficiently, new new types of ways of doing things, and that enables them to actually move up, uh, move along the learning curve, and actually do more innovation. And that helps cement in the success of the industry. So I think you know this is ongoing work, but it's very suggestive of this kind of industrial policy in this particular example being quite quite successful. Now. Not all policies work, so there are also policies towards um, shifting the, uh, you know, for example, here, here's an example. It, Germany introduced feed-in tariffs to encourage the shift to renewables, which was very successful. Um, that didn't lead to a big growth of, uh, of the solar panel industry in Germany. It led to a much bigger increase of the demand in, in, of the supply in China. So China responded to policies around the world by producing more solar panels. So, you know, the increasing the demand, you know, changing the kind of renewable mix is useful and is a good thing to do, but it won't necessarily increase the, the success of the, in, in the industry. So, you know, I, I think this is interesting because Chinese industrial policy here in, did increase the supply of panels, which helped lower the price and, and also helped innovation. Um, it may have, you know, it may also have helped itself. So this was a policy that China designed. It wasn't a... It wasn't meant to be a, a, a free thing for the rest of the world. It was a policy they thought would be good for China. And it's an example of where you can think of policies, and this could be true of the European Union as well. These are policies which could actually be beneficial for the growth of an industry, but also have an effect of helping reduce emissions. And it helps, re it helps re reduce this kind of you know, free rider problem, because it's a policy which is both good for a country or good for a group of countries, as well as good for the world. And it can make, there may be lessons for other clean technologies. Think of wind, think of hydrogen, think of carbon capture, think of small nuclear power, et cetera. OK, so that's it. Um, you know, I, you know I, I've, uh, I've argued that we face these big threats, but they all, also we have these opportunities for creative policies, especially around innovation and diffusion. There's a lot of evidence, I think, over what can be achieved, both structural policies and, and direct policies. Um, I think you know, every country uh, has to think about its own set of policies, depending on its politics and its institutions and its capabilities. So, um, but I think that it's an opportunity, both for the country and also for groups of countries like the European Union, to think about you know, these new kind of plans. I and mean, I think the European uh, Rescue uh, and Resiliency Fund is part of this, this process. So binding these together in a mission around the big challenges, climate change, defense, and healthcare, I really think is what we need, a new Marshall Plan for growth to get sustainable and equitable growth in the world today. Thank you very much. <coughs> Please stay on stage because I would like to give the audience, before we invite our commentators on stage, if you have any questions now directly to John Van Rienen, please raise your hand and wait for a microphone. Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, among the recent uh, developments, I guess, is sort of a deglobalization uh, of the world. It looks from your uh, results that globalization and trade and so on would be pretty important in promoting new technologies and growth. So what's your view on, you know, what's going to happen? EU is now going to become self-sufficient and 
trade barriers are being set up and so forth. Yes, well, you know, as, as, as living in a country which foolishly <laughs> decided to go for Brexit despite all my best efforts <laughs> to go in the other direction, I have to say it's with a lot of, you know, a lot of sadness that that happens. And yeah, we are living in a period, I think, of, of deglobalization. Um, you know, I, I hope that it doesn't go as far as it did, for example, in the interwar period when we had deglobalization, it led to absolute disaster. Uh, it does gonna it's gonna have another set of challenges because I think that it's going to uh, put you know gonna s help slow down productivity, but it's a reality. I think pr I think probably what will happen is as you say it's it's not gonna be. I think it will be more like we move towards regional blocks. So there'll be a more say a, a European maybe North Atlantic ish block depending on <laughs> who's elected in a couple of years, uh, a kind of more Asiatic kind of block. Um, so there will be you know it won't be going back to your country, but it will be more, it, it will be somehow uh, with more, more barriers. So we, we have to take that as a, as a, as a probably reality and think about how we, um, how we respond to that. I think one of the failures of globalization, I think we underestimated the costs. So I think although it was beneficial for productivity growth, the benefits were, the, you know, the, all the costs were too focused on lots of low skilled workers in blue collar jobs and manufacturing. And there wasn't enough emphasis on how to you know, put protections in for those workers and help them manage the transition. I think we're kind of reaping the rewards of, of that failure to really deal with, to, I, I, I give myself in this, to, to think about how costly globalization was. So in order to get new globalization, in some sense, we had to think about these type of policies to actually not just get growth, but also improve things for people who are of worse off groups. Thank you. And uh, Let's keep the rest of the questions for the panel discussion. So please, John, take a seat, and I will soon invite our first commentator on stage, uh, who is Laura. And, and I would like to say that both Laura and Sven Olaf are, of course, invited to give a sort of Swedish contextualization from the employer employer perspective and the employee perspective, but also you're both accomplished economists, uh, researchers in your own right. So we really look forward to your comments, both from sort of your organization's point of view, but also from your researchers' point of view. So I will start with Laura. You have five minutes and then Sven Olof will have the same. Thank you for this great opportunity to uh, uh, give a comment. You say so many clever things. Uh, I will comment on mainly three uh, or make three points. The first one is about uh, the importance of just transition and climate change policies that are actually, as you said as your last point, broader than innovation policies. And I will uh, make a praise for the Swedish model, which I think is a key element in making this possible. Uh, my second comment will be on the lost Einsteins and Marie Curie's. And finally, some words about the management models. Um, we are not afraid of uh, new technologies. We are afraid of old technologies. That's sort of the comment from Swedish unions and a key uh, cornerstone in the Swedish model. Uh, and that is not all unions around the world that say that. That is actually quite unique. We are not afraid of uh, old tec uh, new techniques. We are afraid of old techniques. Uh, and that. Um, in order that to be true and really keep that kind of attitude uh, alive, some key elements has to be on place, uh, which I think it characterizes the Swedish model over the years. The first one is, of course, uh, security in transition. Old uh, jobs disappear, uh, new jobs arise. We don't want to uh, keep up uh, non-competitive firms uh, alive. Uh, they should disappear in order the transition to be possible and that people need to feel secure in this the kind of transition. And that, of course, builds on labor market policies, good income security, and these kind of elements uh, that uh, uh, support that kind of attitude. The second point, of, co of course, uh, just transition of the costs and the profits that this transition implies. And finally, the new jobs that arise should be better jobs than the old ones. And that is the key element that you're talking about, the productivity growth. And a, a system that really makes sure that we have these three pillars, uh, good uh, uh, and at place, makes sure that we get the productivity growth. Uh, 
And, and why am I talking about this? Uh, because I think the climate change policies that everybody is talking about, or at least should be talking about, very much concentrates on green transition of the industries and the businesses, which is an important question, of course, how sh to make sure that we get these new industries. And I think Sweden has fantastic opportunities uh, with our knowledge society to make sure of that. We have a good legislation and, and agreements on a European level already at place. We have the emission rights, uh, markets and, and trading. But the key issue is that in order that to sort of really have an impact, we must make sure that there's an acceptance among people to this transition. And I think what we see around the world is that we don't have that acceptance everywhere. We see the yellow vests on streets, we see protests. And in order to make sure that this, all this fantastic innovation that we, with help of policy, as John says, are able to put in place, really gets an uh, impact, we must make sure that the people are with us. And that the new jobs that we create are better jobs, that you feel secure in the transition. So what I'm simply saying is that the, the idea of uh, we don't protect firms, we protect the uh, workers, we love new technologies, uh, is sort of a golden piece that I think should be exported in other countries in this situation, not, uh, not uh, risk it at home. Uh, and I think, I really think that this is a, a, a necessity that we should talk much more about and, and make climate policies to include a broader part of the basically all the welfare, the labor market policies that we uh, have in, in our countries. Well, my second part about the lost Einsteins and Marie Curies, um, I'm so delighted that report after report from OECD, IMF and other countries now truly uh, accept and not only accept but promote the idea that uh, equality is good for growth. That has been an issue for economists and economies for a long time. Is it possible to combine? And it is. And the key issue why it is so good for growth is exactly the lost Einstein's uh, phenomenon, namely that by education, we make sure that the talents from, from uh, uh, worker classes and, and low-income families are uh, put ahead. And finally, a comment on management, which I think is highly interesting, uh, the management quality. Uh, I've been working uh, quite a lot with that issue as well. There's uh, uh, space for improvements even in Sweden. We saw the variation as you showed in your, uh, in your um, figures. But I think that the tradition with flat and horizontal organizations, with quite informal leadership uh, and, and strong unions that make it easy to include the employees in both designing and implementing new uh, technologies and, and innovations is a very good uh, starting point uh, to, to Im for, for these innovations to get an impact. But what I think is uh, interesting, and that will be my final point or, or, uh, or a question to John, we do have quite different management cultures in different countries. Still, we see a sort of this variation in quality. Uh, and I sometimes have uh, uh, thought that the Im introducing American quite sort of hierarchic and, and uh, compliance, uh, um, strong uh, management cultures in the Swedish context may not be the best uh, uh, thing to do, and probably vice versa as well. Is there a research looking into this, how you can sort of import or export the management models to other countries? Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, and let's give her a round of applause. Uh, and also, uh, very welcome to you, Sven Olof, to give your introductory remark. Uh, first, thank you very much for SNS for inviting me, and uh, uh, thanks also to Professor Van Renden for a very impressive and thought-provoking talk. Uh, uh, I, were, I need to say also something about Svens Nairingsliv, that something that uh, is different from for our organizations compared to many other organizations in Europe is that we are actually not pro-business, we are pro-market, and that's, that's a very important difference. Uh, I agree here that the declining uh, total fact factor productivity rates across Europe, United States and the United Kingdom are troublesome. Um, and what can European policymakers actually do to stop these declining growth rates? What kind of policies can they implement to make the European economy grow at least at the same pace as the United States? 
of 95, at least then. Uh, in the end, it's about making the pie larger so that everybody can have a larger slice of the pie. And I think Professor uh, John van Rennen here points towards innovation as a key to promote long-run growth, and uh, I very, very much agree on that point. Uh, he also argues that governments need to take an active role since we have too few innovations due to different market failures. But what kind of uh, uh, intervention works and what kind of government interventions do not work? I think that this is a very cent central and a very, very important question to address. Um, and here I would actually take the time to read a paragraph from a very recently launched book titled uh, Questioning the Entrepreneurial State. Uh, which is actually open as, uh, available as open access and has uh, been released this year and has over 150,000 downloads. So here the authors write that, uh, in many regards, this book is a warning. Huge government schemes towards specific noble outcomes have historically been implored with failures. In sum, we argue that innovation policy needs to be inverted. Instead of being specific and targeted, uh, it needs to be broad and general, uh, focusing on the general con conditions for firms to operate. Uh, and I very much agree on this, this uh, quote, because I have, I'm, I have myself in my previous life as a researcher uh, looked at, uh, uh, evaluated Vinova's uh, policies or uh, government grants towards innovative small firms. And we found no effect on number of employees, no effect on sales, no significant effect on productivity, no effect on uh, the demand for high-skilled labor. So there were no, no spillovers at all the, that could spill over uh, to other firms. Uh, so I think the direct government R&D grants are kind of uh, unlikely to have the intended effects that we are hoping for. There are a number of reasons why, and I will just give you some examples. First, I think it's very, very difficult to pick winners, uh, both for private investors, but certainly for government agencies. Innovative high growth firms usually grow fast in one period, and then they don't grow anymore. I, I, I call them one-hit wonders. They are more like Vanilla Ice than Bruce Springsteen, to, to take an example. Uh, and it's actually not enough that these programs have a positive impact. Uh, the effect must be so large that it actually covers the often high costs, costs associated with these programs. Uh, furthermore, targeted programs towards innovative firms also create a rent-seeking behavior. So firms use resources to apply for grants instead of using these resources to develop their business. So this will crowd out, they'll crowd out more productive investments. Uh, and finally, this program can also distort competition and have a negative effect on more productive firms that are not applying for these grants. So thereby have a negative effect on innovation that are actually more beneficial for the society. And I think that uh, this that makes this kind of support programs prob problematic. However, note that I don't argue that all direct government grants are inefficient. However, I do believe that we need more research on what actually works and what doesn't work and preferably using randomized controlled trials. Uh, and R&D tax credits that you talk about a bit, I think they're more likely to be more effective since they're general and they don't distort market or create rent behavior to the same extent as targeted R&D grants. Well, to move on, I find your research on management capabilities very, very uh, interesting. And I think it might be an important explanation for innovation-driven growth. Uh, and I would like here to mention some research done by uh, Edith Penrose in the late 50s. Uh, she's not very well known among economists, but she's highly regarded among management and entrepreneurship scholars. Penrose argued that one of the most important barriers that prevents firms from growing is the lack of management capabilities. So it kind of fits your story. Her theory stresses that limits to managerial attention for finding the most productive use of its resources and capabilities will eventually limit firms' growth rates. So they need to invest in management capability all the time if they want to have uh, productivity growth. This is known as the Penrose effect. So I believe that we need to open up the black box of management-driven growth, and I think you have made a huge contribution in this area, and I do hope the future research can build on, this, on your research and de develop it even further. 
Finally, as Laura did, I would like to comment on the lost Einsteins. In Sweden, we have around 1.3 million individuals in the working age, and now I'm excluding students, uh, uh, that have an income that is so low that they actually can't live on it. Many of these individuals are living in segregated neighborhoods and have difficulties in entering the labor market. So, if we want to increase innovations, we also need to improve the job possibilities for those living in these neighborhoods. This means that we need also need to improve the conditions for firms in low service jobs. They might not produce radical innovations, but they're important job contributors for those that are living in segregated neighborhoods. As such, this firm can actually provide brighter opportunities for children that are living in these areas, implying that lost Einsteins actually might be found. So thank you for letting me comment on your research. Uh, it's been truly a privilege and a great honor. Thanks. Thank you. Sven Obolov will share uh, this table, and John, you will have a, John, you will have a table on your, of your own. <laughs> and uh, I will soon you. let you in the audience in as well, but I would like uh, uh, Professor John van Rienen, if you would like to comment on your commentators. <laughs> and you can uh, pick and choose, and then maybe I will follow up with some questions. Okay. I mean, I mean thank you very, very much for the ex two excellent discussions and lots of thought-provoking uh, comments. So. I really, really appreciate that. Um, just, just a couple of, um, couple of comments. I mean, you know, I, I don't know the Swedish model <laughs> in, in the kind of depths that Lara, Lara was describing, but I think broadly, I think it's a lot, it has a positive thing. So the, the idea of accepting change, thinking of how to deal with new technologies, trying to involve people in making decision making is, is really important. So. I, the, the, the description of um, the American, you know, like when we do management practice, I don't really think of these as American management practices or, or British management. I think these are kind of management practices which have been shown generally to help increase productivity in a range of cultures. In fact, many of them came out of Japan. So many of, many of the basic practices that we measure are, are like the Toyota production system, which an intrinsic part of that is involving workers getting workers to kind of empower, you know, take decisions, empower them to give suggestions. And, and you know, many of our measures actually on decentralization, Sweden comes very high up on that. So there seems to be a much more flatter. And I think that's a, that's a really powerful thing. And it actually links to the Penrose point. Mm. Because one of, one of the things that Edith Penrose, is actually a brilliant scholar, if any of you haven't read her and really, really underappreciated, she makes the point that yes, you know, better managed firms can grow and one of the limits to growth is management. But actually the ability to um, decentralize is also crucial. Yeah. You, you know, once you get to a certain size, you can't run everything from, from, the, from the top. You have to be able to decentralize. So countries where it's hard to decentralize also find it hard to grow as well. The things which can foster you know, decentralization, maybe higher trust, which also Sweden does well on, and other kinds of things, high skills are also part of, part of that package. So, you know, I lost Einstein's, you know, I, I, I think your points are really well taken. And I, I think the, um, the, one of the things which really worries me about what's happened with especially the COVID period is that, you know, this generation, you know, my daughter's 15 and the generation uh, who are in her age group and younger have missed out on amounts of education. Now, you know, I'm, I'm from a relatively wealthy middle class family. You know, we have, you know, online computing at home and we can support her. But there's a lot of people from low income families who have just lost out masses of education. And that's a potential huge loss of lost Einstein's, lost Marie Curie's, as well as the, the loss of, uh, of their, chance, their life chances. So, you know, we really have to think of ways of how we bring those groups up after the, the, loss of, uh, the, the losses of education, unless we're going to lose a generation of people. So on, on the critique, I mean, uh, you know, it's, all your points are well taken, Sven. I have to say, you know, you know my, as an economist, of course, my uh, instinct is to go for the, what we call horizontal policies. So the policies like you know, already tax credit, general tax policies, competition policies, which are kind of common, you know, you know openness to trade and so on. But I, I become more convinced uh, over the years that many of these more direct um, R&D grants or other grants can actually be effective. Now, not always, as you described, but you, know, you have to be really careful in evaluating them because, of course, often the grants are given to companies and areas which are not doing well. 
And of course, that oh, creates a bias. Well, it actually turns out a lot of it, the bias is actually yeah. to, well, the money actually is not doing well. Mm -hmm. And that ends up underestimating some of the effects, the benefits. So the well-designed studies, like the re regression discontinuity design, where you can just look at people who just won versus just lost, mm -hmm. Not all of them, but many of them do show positive effects. So I become more optimistic that the more directive policies, if they're well um, targeted, can work. And of course, the, you know, the good thing, you know, the, the, the R&D tax credit, the problem with, with, with those, although they're more neutral, so don't, you know, mm. don't have some of the problems of lobbying that you described, they're not well targeted at things we might want. So the things which create greater spillovers you know, if you want to have climate change or specific things, it's harder to direct it with a kind of horizontal uh, tax policy. So I do think there is a role um, for thinking creatively about these these more direct um, grants. So I become more optimistic about that. Now, yeah, I, and I, I'm totally aware. I don't need carte blanche to all the <laughs> terrible industrial policies that we've seen in Europe in the 1970s. But I think as economists, we became, you know, we, it, saying the word industrial policy became a dirty word. And I think, you know, you could say, well, government's going to do this anyway. <laughs> so at least we should try and guide them into doing things which are, which are better rather than, rather than not too crazy. So, so I, I, do, I'm, I become a bit more, opt I become more optimistic than there are ways of doing it. But all your points are very well taken, that there's lots of possibilities of things going wrong. State capacity is very important. So, in, in, you know, in, in countries where we think we have, um, you know, relatively good state capacity, like Sweden, we might be more optimistic than in countries where state capacity is very low. So yeah, those are some of the considerations. But anyway, thanks, thanks very much, and that's some of my reactions. Thank you. I would like to pick up on that with the, the industrial policy, because maybe it was a dirty word, but as far as I can tell now, it's really a new spring for industrial policy uh, uh, all over the world, more or less. And I would like to ask all three of you, how, how open are policymakers for good advice and guiding from, from research, do you think? What's your... Um, experience so far, John, <laughs> when you're out <laughs> describing these... Uh, I just told me, my policy got it towards Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> completely ignored. <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, you have to be realistic, right? So, you know, politicians are, you know, are, are, are in a democracy, want to get elected, and so they're going to focus on typically ways to get re-elected and short-term short things. And I think in, the, in this area of growth policy, it's a massive problem because a lot of the things that we need to do, the, the benefits of these policies are not going to happen in, in one year or two years, it's over a number of years. So the, the, the challenge is how you deal with what I call policy attention deficit disorder. The, you know, policies are short term, they like to change the policies. You know, you've seen in Britain, like four prime ministers and six year new person gets in reverse of the policy. So I think you have to think about how you craft institutions which can support growth but can put some kind of friction in the, in the wheels of politicians flip-flopping and changing. So things like independence, you know, think about monetary policy, having a, you know, an independent bank setting interest rates, that's really important, we know that. Having an independent competition authority, that's really important. Um, having independent fiscal forecasters, that's really important. So I would think about creating those institutions. You can think about similar for infrastructure and innovation policies, which are you know have some autonomy from the political process. Now you're never going to get completely away from politics in a democracy, but you can do things which can make it harder for politicians to reverse very quickly or to stop and start things. So I think that's what we have to think about: is those how we can craft those kind of built to last institutions for growth policies which can overcome some of this. So I guess that's a response to my, you know, my advice often being ignored. <laughs> Not always, sometimes, but you know. Laura, would you like to? Yeah, I mean, I, I, my impression is from different roles uh, in, as a uh, researcher and, and in government agencies as a researcher, that Swedish politicians are, are quite open uh, and uh, welcoming, but I think you're, you have a good point in this time span question. It's, uh, it's not always easy to, see, to make these decisions that are long term. And also I'd say that I hear often researchers complaining that the politicians don't listen and they don't understand. But I think you know, the question we should ask ourselves is, are we enough clear in our argumentation? Do we understand the reality that the politicians face? And not only by winning the, the elections, but also all these kind of restrictions that they 
have in their reality. So, so I think researchers, if you're interested, which I've always been, to, to get an impact with the knowledge I produce and, and others produce, you really have to put an effort on, on sort of understanding uh, the conditions and, and uh, being able to communicate clearly. Olof, would you like to come in? Yeah, well, I think that politicians are listening to policy advice that they like, otherwise not, <laughs> if I'm a, a bit uh, frank. But uh, I also think that we as researchers uh, need to be kind of um, taking in a long-term view. So I, I, one professor, Lars Hulkrans, I talked to him, he has been giving a lot of policy advice to different policymakers during his years as a researcher, and often they haven't listened to him, even if he has been proven right afterwards. <laughs> uh, and I asked him, uh, how, how, you must be so disappointed. And he said, no, 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 Sven Olof, you, you are too uh, short-sighted. You have to have a long-run view. You have to take at least four years so you have a new election cycle. So I think that's very true. So sometimes you have to take a more longer perspective when it comes to policy advice. I would like to invite you to ask questions and comments. Just raise your hand and you will get the microphone. And uh, don't do like Pelle Strandberg, say who you are before. You're. So we are two. Let's start here. Thank you very much. Helena Angelis from Stockholm School of Economics plus the um, Brussels-based think tank FS Center. I'm becoming more and more bigger and bigger fan of um, mission-oriented policies not uh, only of all the work of Mariano Mazzucatos on the European level, but in general. I believe there is lots of blanket wars going on, because on one hand we want to increase productivity or we want to support this part of the economy, but if we have a mission to achieve, whatever that mission is, it could be your new Marshall Plan, like dealing with new pandemics in the future, that makes the society and the economy work collectively, to find the solution and stop the blanket uh, war. For that to work, this whole government approach is needed, the new buzzword uh, on the scene. I'd like to hear view of your views on how to make... I don't like the question. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to hear your view on how to make different parts of um, government to work together to work towards one mission, maybe to co-fund different programs together, to set a goal which is beyond their individual sector of responsibility. What kind of miracle needs to happen or be put in place for this collaboration to work? Thank, Thank you. you. So who would like to take that one? I'm probably the one who is most skeptical, so uh, I can answer first and then you can be. <laughs> no, no, I think that I, I don't really believe in these mission-oriented policies. And the reason is actually that we really often governments and we, we don't know what we want. We don't know what the future brings. So uh, I think that a huge risk is, for instance, investing a lot in green technology. You really don't know which technology will be in the future. So that's a huge risk that you might actually spend just a lot of money on something that will be a big failure. Uh, so I'm much more optimistic about than giving a more general conditions for firms to compete for the right technology in the future. Um, so that, that's my view on it. I, I, I probably you have you two have another view. <laughs> Let's <laughs> so. take uh, Laura and then John. I have an uh, I have a, another view definitely, and I I'm I, I, I know, I, for me mission driven policy is not uh, steering it in detail and and uh, having all these uh, supports uh, like in a detailed level. It is somehow telling the the big story. Where are we heading? What do we want? And I think especially looking at this uh, election campaign, we've definitely lacked that in the Swedish policy there's been a sort of a negative <laughs> campaign where we say everything that we don't want but but not sort of painting the picture where we are going and that's definitely needed in this climate change and then you can then it's, it's a question of leadership and management at the government level I'd say that the Swedish uh, government offices is one of the most uh, divided organizations that we have where everybody doesn't draw in the same direction and eventually it's the question of course for the for the top leadership to to tell that story John yeah thanks Helena um, you know the I mean I think 
the idea that there are missions is a good is a good thing. So I mean, like the fact that we know we have to deal with climate change as a major challenge, I think should be at the the, 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 the centre of government policy. So if you want to think that as a mission to galvanise action, I think it's 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 the right thing to do. I think that. I've often found, certainly in debates with people and, and policymakers, and talk about how we influence people. That if you just go through like I did, like I went through the tool, the toolkit, you know, the light bulb thing, and that's all very well, but it doesn't really excite people. You know, it's all the cost-benefit analysis that economists do. Sometimes you need to kind of bind them all together in a program for it to be an effective way of galvanising action across government and society. So, in that sense, missions can be very useful as a way of motivating people to do that. How you make that institutionally happen in a particular country is going to depend very much on that particular kind of what's, you know, what works well in Sweden is not going to be the same model as works in the UK as, as works in China. So I, I think the, 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 for the, I mean, I talk about the UK case as, as I perhaps know it a little bit better. Um, what we tried to do in, in 2013 is we had this thing called the LSE Growth Commission and we tried to look at some of the big challenges facing the UK, like the things that we've just described. And what we proposed was uh, around things like infrastructure to deal with the energy transition, rather than having that, um, you know, being in lots of different parts of governments and very decentralized, so people can always block planning decisions is not in my backyard, actually have a architect, new architecture of institutions where you had a infrastructure commission which would be, you know, with independent experts looking at the big national things like, you know, you know new, new, new um, uh, airports, road systems, etc. Uh, an infrastructure bank, which could actually provide long-term financing, so partly public and partly private, and some some other things. But a new set of um, kind of uh, a new architecture of institutions to deal with kind of long-run infrastructure. And you know, the government has actually adopted. Part of those, part of our proposals, right? so I think that's part of how you need to, you know, so you have to, and, and the the infrastructure um, groups interact with lots of government departments, so it pulls in the relevant parts of government departments, but it ha can take a long term view, it can it exists even when politicians come and go, it can use expertise, use the public and private sector, so that would be an example. I mean, that's specific to the UK, but there may there's other other examples that we could talk about. So combining. I think that sense of urgency through the mission, creating the new institutions, which kind of help link up different parts of governments, maybe reduce some of this kind of short-termism. Sometimes that, you know, that, that might be examples of what can work, but it's going to depend very much on, on the particular country you're in. So I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all. So, and, and, and I kind of, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm in between you two in terms of the, where I think about, the, you know, the, you know, I, it's, not you know it, it, it's not just about picking an individual technology. Oh, sure, no. No. I think it's trying to get a portfolio of different potential technologies okay. and then seeing which are successful and supporting the ones which we think are more successful. So there is a risk involved with that. But I, I, again, I, I think we can't get away from the fact that, you know, we need to direct to some degree where we want our technologies to be. So I think that that would be my, my view. Thank you. So we have time for a couple of more questions. Uh, we have um, one over there and then um, Angelica, there is one over there. Uh, yes. Thank you. My, my name is Thomas Nicolin. Uh, I was thinking about the interest rate policies, and uh, we have a huge experiment with low, low interest rates uh, in the whole Western world. Mm. Uh, and one could think that uh, maybe research and innovation would be benefit from that because you could look very lo more lo into the future and make it uh, uh, and spend money now that might generate profits very long long term so that's uh, the int low interest rate would help research in that sense on the other hand you might think that creative distractions won't uh, work because uh, low productivity firms will stay competitive uh, because th there are no costs of uh, the cost of capital is nil uh, so i'd like to hear your view on on the interest rate policy, how that might have affected R&D and might have affected productivity, productivity growth. Thank you. So I leave that question to you, John. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good question. I mean, the, uh, yeah, the set, so you know, we're going through another experiment now, of course, we're moving into a high interest, higher uh, interest rate world. So 
we'll see how things switch in the other direction. You know, my, um, you know, on the on the the low interest rates um, and quant you know quantitative easing, I think has um, meant there are some so-called zombie firms, who very low productivity firms who in kind of normal times would disappear are kind of kept on this kind of artificial life support by having this easy money and low. So I think that has been a contributor to the low productivity growth. I don't think it's the major, major factor, but I think it is, is a, 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 a factor that there's a lot of firms which have been able to, so I mean, you know, the, some of the parts, the COVID support have also done that. So there is some, there is some of that element, even though I don't think that's the major, major reason for our low productivity growth. In terms of whether the low interest rates have stimulated more uh, innovation, I mean, I, I think the thing is a lot of um, innovation is actually through equity finance rather than debt, debt finance. So there's, you know, the role of, I mean, the, the role of low interest rates and in, in increasing the amounts of resources spent on it hasn't been very strong. I mean, one of the saddest things, I think, is that, you know, take my government, you know, in the UK, when you know, interest rates were extremely low, so you could actually borrow a lot to make investments and innovate in, in R&D, innovation infrastructure. You know, in that period of time, in the 2010 to 2013 period, they did the opposite. <laughs> they actually cut back on lots of kind of public investments. I think the, the low productivity growth the UK had was actually related to that. So you know, I think that that was a, that, you know, that, that a, 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 a governments had an advantage at that point, or some governments who could Borrowlow had, had a possibility of, of making investments which they didn't make. So uh, I think uh, you know, that didn't seem to trend. Tra Thank you. So we will take one last question, even though uh, the time is five o'clock. Please. Thank you very much. My name is Lars Sunell. And uh, I first want to add to the lost Einstein's argument, because it was actually made by Marshall um, uh, some 120 years ago, when he argued in favor of general education, even for poor kids. But I, I would like to address or ask you about another loss. And the argument was made by James Tobin in, in a speech some 40 years ago when he said that <clears throat> he was afraid that in the future, and this was in 1985, that in the future we would lose uh, some of the best students to the financial sector. I mean, he didn't mention the financial sector, but he, he said that they would be lost to <laughs> employments which would be much more remunerative than, for example, working in the public sector or becoming a university teacher or a researcher. And uh, uh, of course, we have seen that that has actually happened because in some years, around 40 percent of the best students end up in the financial sector. And when I look at your tables here and see that the product productivity growth in 1950-73, which we all know was, was very, very high, I am quite certain that the allocation of human capital was much more efficient in those years. Thank you. So would you like to make a comment on that? Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great point. And like, again, I mean, in the UK and the US, if you look at you know, the graduates from why I used to work at MIT, uh, you know, so a lot of, uh, and Harvard, a lot of them <laughs> ended up working in the financial sector and the same with LSE, loads of them go into, into the financial sector. And uh, we don't think there's lots of the positive spillover benefits that we might get from research in finance. In fact, as we learned from the financial crisis, many of those spillovers might be quite negative. Uh, so I, I think it is, there is an issue of, of misallocation across sectors in those countries where finance has a, had a, has a very big fraction and sucks in a lot of the talent. Now, there's been, a there's been a kind of reversion of that, of course. So after the financial crisis, there's been more regulation and those sectors have, have shrunk in, in, in size to some degree. So that, that would push a little bit in the opposite direction. Um, but I, I do think, um, I mean, one way to think about this is you need to make the rewards and the attractiveness of a career in innovation good in order to kind of pull people in, into those. So I, th I think there is a, there is a potential loss. I have to say, if you, we can talk about the evidence, the evidence is not, you know, the real, this good academic evidence on this is not, you know, overwhelming. <laughs> uh, but I, I kind of believe it, what you said. I kind of believe that a rent-seeking activity is sucking out some of the talent. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much. I would like to 
to this will be the concluding remark, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I would like to give just one uh, one last uh, sort of uh, concluding remark to each of you, and I would like to to focus on the election that uh, we had uh, this last week, <laughs> and we haven't got a new government yet, but we will hopefully not wait as long as we did last time. So, what would you be be your sort of main advice to the new Swedish government? And let's start with. John, who you will probably say you don't know as much about the Swedish context, but from your research, what would be some kind of general advice to a new government? Well, okay, I, I worry a lot if the new government it has a very populist type of agenda, because I think around the world we've seen populism as associated with short-termism and offering easy solutions to complex problems. So I hope whoever the new government is, they don't do that and they actually think about the long-term and tackle the difficult solutions. Uh, and I'll add one other thing on, maybe controversially, <coughs> if you look at immigration, one of the results in the innovation literature is that immigration is one of the strong positive drivers of in innovation, particularly skilled innovation, which may be less relevant for some of the debates which have happened, but being open to uh, other countries um, through immigration is generally seen as generally economically, despite its political problems, a very positive thing. Thank you. Sven Olof? Well, I, I believe that the government will have a huge task on its hand, and uh, it's, a ve it's very, very difficult. I mean, it, for instance, the energy crisis, the labor market. Um, so, uh, no, they need to fast kind of get together, have a financial plan, first of all, uh, and then also try to do more kind of structural reform, long-sided reform. I think most of the Political debate in Sweden now has been very short-sighted. It's been a lot focused on different compensation, different support programs, and stuff like that. I mean, in now to focus more on getting. I mean, for instance, so we have a very high unemployment rate. We have a lot of people that have really big problems to to actually make a living. Uh, we have problem with segregated neighborhoods. We need to we need to really address this, and this means that we need to look at different solutions that we maybe haven't looked at before. So they, they must be brave, I would say. Thank you. Mm. Laura? Mm. Yeah, there are uh, both long-term problems, but also very short-term problems, though. They really have to have the capacity to handle this high inflation towards uh, uh, business cycle, uh, bad business cycle uh, situation where they have to give very uh, quick uh, decisions how they're going to solve their energy, high energy prices and make sure that Swedish household actually survive this winter. This is the short one of the short term problems. The other one is, of course, the labor market issues. We still have a higher unemployment, as Sven Olof said, and there are lots of capacities still on the labor market. Not There are long term unemployed, but there are, there are also short term unemployed that are not matched to the jobs that there are, because in parts of the economy, there's a lot of need of labor force. So this matching problem, they have to be start solving yesterday. Oh. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for coming here. Thank you, John van, Rien van Rienen, Sven Olof Daunfeldt and Laura Hartmann. And thank you. <laughs> and <laughs> I hope that you all have time to stick around, have a drink and continue the conversation outside.